If you would like, you can grab your Bible or read from the front here on the board. We will be reading from Matthew 16, 21 through 26. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please pray with me. May the words I speak, those words we hear, be from the heart of God. Lord, may your words this morning challenge us, make us think and act. It's your name that we pray this morning. Amen. Well, the past few years, I have become quite fond of blueberry picking. It's a place of peace and stillness. It just soothes my mind and my soul, like an inexpensive therapy. My worries, my inner conflicts, all those fears that I have, they just fade away as I carefully walk around the bush collecting berries. Now there's one particular blueberry bush that I enjoy visiting. It sits in the yard of Nancy and Lyndon's old place, not too far from here along this busy road we call Nesbitt Lake. This large bush, it rarely disappoints during the season. It's covered in berries from the tip top to the bottom. And with a thorough inspection, one could see the exhausting task before them before even reaching for a berry. It's covered. But I have a system. Okay, so I like to first reach out, arms level, eye level, and collect the berries. And then my eyes move up, and I reach up towards the top of the bush, collecting as many berries as possible. But while I'm up there fumbling about and grabbing, most of those berries fall to the ground rather than end up in my basket. That's the easy part. But then I move on to the challenging job of concentrating on that dreaded lower section of this blueberry bush. Now, it's at that moment that I have to twist like this. You know, you, you've done it before. Twist my arms and contort my back and neck and these unusual postures. The term bending over backwards comes to mind to get those berries. And along the bottom of this bush, it's where most of the berries are found. The branches, they're weighted down with the bulk of the fruit. And I have to pull and finagle the branches in the most uncomfortable positions to gather those berries. And at times, my nose, it's like inches from the ground. But it's at this moment that I'm giving this moment of grace where I locate those berries that I dropped earlier and I can collect them even though they're they lay on the ground but when I come back up to standing position my hair is a mess it's all entangled strands are outwards and twigs are protruding 
from my hair. My knees and my back, they ache. Yes, I'm old. I turned 40 a couple of days ago. And my arms are even covered in scratches from the branches. And he, those like passing by quickly in the car, because it's right by the road, those passing by in their cars probably come to the, this realization that she must have gotten into some sort of altercation. Well, I have with the blueberry bush. But all that hard work has led to a basket full of blueberries. Now, today we look at the text in Matthew that occurs in the middle of Christ's identity being discussed publicly and among his disciples. And um, at the beginning of chapter 16, you can read that the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they're demanding this sign from Jesus. They want him to prove who he claims to be. Now, there were some signs already in place, these miraculous healings that happened for the Canaanite woman's daughter, um, and also this large crowd numbering in the thousands that Jesus fed with just a minuscule bit of food, but that wasn't enough to them. But here Jesus, he sees it important to prepare his disciples for what's to come of him. He's going to endure this great suffering be killed and rise three days later. And immediately we see Peter's discomfort with this statement. Peter, like many Jews of his time, they believed that the Messiah was going to come in this military might and force and conquer the Jewish opponent. Not suffering and death, as Jesus spoke of. God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you, Peter cries. But Jesus, he's having none of this talk. He calls Peter Satan, yikes, and a trip hazard. Bless his heart. Bless his heart, as we say here in the South. Poor Peter, just six verses before, six, you can read it. Jesus is praising Peter, calling him the rock on which his church is to be built. Yet now Peter has his mind on human things, not divine things. Now Jesus, he continues to describe what it means, what he means by thinking on, on divine things. He says, if you want to become my follower, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. So Jesus is communicating here to his disciples then they're not going to be just witnesses of his suffering, but they're going to have to take part in it as well. And the same is expected of us today. We must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Christ. And by taking up our cross, we carry the burdens of others. Just as Christ carried our burdens on his shoulders to Calvary. This is the faithful way that we deny ourselves and follow the path of Christ. Now he goes on in verse 25. He says, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. What will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? What will they give in return for their life? Now, here these verses are a little familiar. They're similar to the temptation of Jesus. Just a few verses before, not verses, chapters before, the devil, we all know this story, entices Jesus. He entices him to save his life, you know, by commanding the stones to become bread so that he may eat, to lose his life when he encourages Jesus to throw himself from the temple wall, remember? And um, lastly, to gain the world by worshiping the devil. No wonder Jesus is so harsh on poor Peter, calling him Satan. It's as if Jesus is having this flashback to his dealings with the devil in the wilderness. But the reason that we empathize with Peter is because we are Peter in this story, right? We can relate to Peter. It's our default setting as humans 
to choose the easier, shorter, less bumpy ride in life. Our human selfishness and our fear, it gets the best of us most of the time. But this story, it, it pushes us to change those settings and place our minds and our hearts on divine ideas rather than our human habits. Now, I took my first drawing class as an art student at JSU. And before then, I would draw pictures on spiral notebook paper, copy paper, if I could find it, uh, those yellow legal notepads, you know what I'm talking about? But in college, on a, in a college level drawing class, I was introduced to the 18 by 24 inch drawing pad, much larger than what I was expected, or you know, accustomed to drawing to. Um, but after my first few drawings in that class, my professor, she confronted me. She asked, why do you keep your drawings so small? Look at all this paper that's unused. No one should see a magnifying glass to see your you know, talent on this paper. And she was right, my drawings, they were insignificantly placed in the center of that paper, that large paper. It was a natural habit that I had created over the years, drawing on smaller material. And it took a bit of practice, a lot of effort to move that pencil beyond that small space, reaching out towards the edge of that paper. It wasn't easy. And we all have those habits, those human settings in place, and they're difficult to change. But when I made those changes at, on my artwork, I was able to broaden my abilities as an artist. Now, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he explains what Christ expects of his followers, how one might deny oneself and reset those human settings that we have in place. And we read that earlier, thank you, Wit, from Romans 12. Here, Paul, he presents these behaviors that are formed by those who have renewed minds and renewed hearts. And many of those actions put us in difficult, uncomfortable situations. Let's look at a few, like allowing our love to be genuine, especially to those that we dislike, even giving food and drink to them, our enemies. Extending hospitality to the stranger, those people that don't look like us, that don't think like us, that act very differently than we do. And not being haughty or arrogant, but associating with the lowly. Giving our time and our effort to humble tasks. That's not easy either. Ooh, here's the kicker. Never repaying evil with evil, but overcoming evil with good. So revenge is out of the question. I guess rejecting our selfish nature and taking up our cross has never been really closely related to the desired lifestyle of power and security. Hmm. Author Clayton Smith writes, God's power is revealed not in walks through the porticos of power, but through the dusty alleys of misery and weakness. This is where Jesus walked. This is where Jesus leads us to walk. This is where he strengthens us to bear the burdens of discipleship. Okay, so maybe if we insert two adjectives into verse 25, we can better understand what Christ is saying. Better amplify that statement he made. So, whosoever will save his lower life will lose the higher life. So we have a lower life and a higher life. Now that higher life is all too familiar. Our higher life is, consists of the greed and the pride and the fear and self-centeredness we deal with daily. Our desire to prosper and compete against one another. Our higher life wants to draw lines where we have to choose these sides to stand behind while knowing that Christ came to erase those lines. And 
that higher life wants to refuse to listen to others but prove that we're right. Or settling for easy answers, half truths superficial relationships, pointing at other people's mistakes while refusing to point that finger back at ourselves. That higher life, it demands nothing but contentment for our own lifestyles, yet we ignore the needs of others, our neighbors, and the oppressions that they face. We were never promised that our journey of faith as followers of Christ would be painless, straightforward, or even comfortable. That path that Christ put before us to follow was anything but that. We know the life Christ led. So what will it take for us to reset our default settings? To deny that individual framework that habitually embraces the human things of life? What will it take? How do we allow our lower life to reign where the comforts of our higher life go so neglected that Christ radiates through our every fiber. We have to serve each other. We have to be servants as Christ served. We have to give of ourselves to one another until we're weak. We have to love each other relentlessly. Relentlessly, it's a big word. So I encourage you, Grab your basket, bend down, get on your knees even, get ready to sweat. Push and tug and maneuver your way through the branches of your lower life. It's not gonna be easy, but it's where an abundance of fruit is to be harvested. That is where our baskets will overflow. Amen.